Morning. We have general questions. Question one, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether Police Scotland use GPS technology to track register sex offenders. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Scotland's multi-agency public protection arrangements provide a robust statutory framework to manage the risks posed by sex offenders. Every decision taken by the relevant MAPA agencies is taken with public safety at the forefront. Uh, we know from international evidence that electronic monitoring is a useful tool that can aid reducing reoffending when set within a wider package of care and support. New research commissioned by the Scottish Government uh, provides evidence to support the use of GPS not as a replacement for the current radio frequency technology, but as an additional tool for people who may have been convicted with a range of offences. I have tasked an expert group uh, with considering how all forms of electronic monitoring, including GPS, can be used more effectively in the future, and that group will make firm recommendations to me by the spring of 2016. Paul Martin. Officer, I have to say I am disappointed uh, with the response from the Minister. The technology for GPS uh, uh, systems to track serious sex offenders has existed for some years, and I understand there is evidence to prove that they are effective. But can I also refer the Minister to the Justice 2 Subcommittee's recommendation that high-risk sex offenders who fail to cooperate with the relevant authorities on matter of a significance or uh, abscond that their details should be provided to local communities and made available on websites such as uh, Crime Stoppers. The presiding officer, I have evidence that at least four individuals have, have su are, are considered such ch child sex offenders' risk, uh, and these individuals have not been provided uh, on the, cr the Crime Stoppers website. I wonder if the minister shares my concern in that respect, and will ensure there is no reoccurrence of this. Minister. Well, first of all, in dealing with the issue around uh, GPS technology, we have commissioned this research, which we have now received, and the uh, uh, expert group that I have tasked to look at this matter will report to us in the spring of next year to look at how we can take forward that technology. I think it is very important, though, in using this type of technology that we introduce it in a way which is measured and that we can be confident that it is robust and secure in the way in which it is being utilised. And that is why the expert group are considering this issue in great detail and we will consider how we can roll matters out uh, further from there. Uh, the member has uh, made reference to the point regarding uh, the availability of information, and as he is aware, police already have powers to disclose information uh, relating to individuals, uh, sex offenders, and that information can be provided to individuals or groups within a community where they believe that it is necessary for the uh, prevention of a crime. If the member, though, has some other specific information that he believes has not been made available where that uh, should have been the case, I'd be more than happy to consider that and to ensure that the member then gets an appropriate response from the agency that was responsible for dealing with that issue. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary is aware, a sex offender released on licence and supervised under MAPA multi-agency protection arrangements must be released into the community from which he or she came unless another local authority volunteers to take them. Now, does he agree with me that in rural communities that's a very specific problem for them as everybody kens everybody else and we sometimes have vigilantism and will he consider looking at reviewing the arrangements, particularly where someone has been released back into a rural community? Cabinet Secretary. The member raises an important point, but I think she's confusing two different things here because it's a national accommodation strategy for sex offenders that sets out the approach that should be taken for the accommodating of uh, sex offenders when, once they are released. That strategy is then used by MAPA in their considerations for a particular instance. So I don't think this is an issue which is more to do with MAPA in itself. It's more an issue around the approach which is set out within the national strategy. But if the member has got some specific experiences which she believes uh, need to be considered, I'd be more than happy uh, to hear from the member and to ensure that these issues are considered appropriately probably, as I say, more within the national strategy rather than within the overall MAPA approach. Question two, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what the objective is of its proposed root and branch review of the planning system. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neill. Presiding officer, the objective of the review is to identify the scope for further reform with a focus on delivering a quicker, more accessible and efficient planning process, in particular increasing delivery of high quality housing development. Mr Gray, sorry. Presiding officer, the problem with planning in East Lothian is that ministers routinely and repeatedly overturn local planning decisions. 
From an unwanted incinerator to numerous inappropriate housing developments, ministers ride roughshod over my constituents' views. Does the minister's answer not suggest that this review is going to reduce local democracy further rather than improving the position? Minister. Presenting officer, I, first of all, I don't agree with the description of the planning system as it applies to the member's constituency, but can I say one of the objectives will be to look at how we can enhance further local democracy and participation in the planning system. But obviously, when ministers consider any matter relating to planning, they have to take many issues into consideration, uh, and they do take into consideration the views of local people. But obviously, as the Minister knows from his own experience in government, you've got to take a wider view, and sometimes that means having to take a different point of view than those of, represented by local people. Colin Q. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President Officer. Uh, will, will the Cap Secretary uh, ensure that any long-term strategic planning review for housing needs includes how infrastructure is planned, managed and paid for, as well as how commuters and traffic movements are planned for in order for any local development plans to be made sustainable. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I think uh, particularly in and around parts of uh, the larger cities in Scotland, there are some major infrastructure challenges, and particularly when it comes to housing development. And obviously, given the constraints we have in the public sector budget at the present time, uh, then we need to ensure that the resources are, are available from whatever source to ensure that the infrastructure that is required to accommodate new housing developments is in place. And in particular, for example, transport is a particular challenge in some parts of uh, Edinburgh. Thank you. I am aware that some members are experiencing difficulty in hearing the sound from their consuls. We have asked to go away and have it checked, um, and hopefully we will get it sorted in the very near future. Uh, question number three, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport last met the Board and Chief Executive of NHS Lanarkshire and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. And government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. John Pentland. There is certainly a lot to talk about, so will the Cabinet Secretary now recommend that given NHS Lancashire has gone from crisis to crisis with the very poor a &E waiting times, yet again the worst in Scotland last week, very high risk staffing as reported last week, possible a &E closure and GP out of hours cut from five to two centres, perhaps permanently, despite you saying that this would be an interim measure, will she now recommend that the board calls in independent experts to undertake a thorough review of NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say to John Pentland that uh, the issue of a &E waiting times is a concern for Wishaw General Hospital, and of course uh, we've been keeping in very close contact with NHS Lanarkshire about that. They have a, an action plan to improve performance at Wishaw General, and I'm certainly happy to furnish John Pentland with more detail about that, but it is comprehensive. I think it would be unfair to suggest that Monklands and Hairmeyer's performance uh, has uh, not been improving, and actually they have been performing very well indeed. It's a pity John Pentland uh, can't recognise that. There will be no A&E closure. And if I can remind John Pentland, the only threat to A&E closures was from his own party, which, of course, had it not been for the fact that it had been overturned, we wouldn't have seen the 500,000 attendances at the A&E department at Monklands, which, of course, if that wasn't the case, then there'd be a lot more pressure on Wishaw and on Hairmeyers. John Pentland Order. also referred to the out-of-hours uh, review, as I've said to John Pentland uh, many times before, the out-of-hours model is an interim one approved by the Health Board back in May on the grounds of patient safety. The longer-term proposals will be developed in consultation with staff and the general public and, as I've said before, have to be consistent with the conclusions of the National Review of out of our Services, which is due shortly. So I hope, from what I've said, that John Pentland will be reassured. I am happy to write to him with more of the actions that NHS Lanarkshire is taking to address some of the issues at Wishaw General. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. 
to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to protect employment in the Fraserburgh area. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presenting officer, our continued investment in infrastructure regeneration and business support is designed to support the area's economy and create and safeguard jobs. For example, an investment of £13.7 million of European Fisheries Fund assistance in Fraserburgh supported harbour deepening and key improvements. This has ensured the long-term operation of the harbour and safeguarded the jobs of over 700 fishermen. I know the Member is aware of the situation with Young's and the Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism has been working closely with the company. I firmly believe that we have offered them a very strong case such that maximum employment can be retained in Fraserburgh. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, may I take the opportunity of thanking the Government on behalf of the, Fish the Harbour Board for the support that has been given. That is certainly uh, a useful contribution to the economy. Uh, but in more specific terms in relation to the situation at Young's, uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give more details on the launch of the Fraserburgh Task Force and how that may contribute uh, to protecting and enhancing employment in the area? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the, the member will be aware of the issues that we face in relation to the um, long-term uh, future of Young's at Fraserburgh. The government has engaged very strongly with the company and Mr Ewing has drawn together all interested parties uh, to ensure that we have a coordinated approach to addressing this particular difficulty. The task force, force will meet for the first time on Monday. Uh, although preparatory work has, of course, been underway to try to support um, in every way we can the, uh, the uh, agenda to protect employment at Young's. And I can assure Mr Stevenson uh, that the government will do everything it possibly can do to safeguard what we know to be a very significant employer in the local economy. Louise MacDonald. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Fergus Ewing was quoted in the press a few days ago as saying that the Scottish Government would match any package of aid that was provided to Young's plant at Grimsby by the UK Government, provided it was compliant with state aid rules. Will Mr Swinney confirm that that is the commitment of the Scottish Government today? Cabinet Secretary. That, that is the commitment of the Scottish Government, and I would reiterate the point that Mr Ewing made in his public remarks, that the assistance that we provide in all circumstances is state aid compliant, and we would expect that of every other offer that is made in these circumstances. Question five, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what action will be taken to address the rising number of deaths as a result of alcohol misuse. Minister Maureen Watt. The rise in alcohol-related deaths is extremely disappointing and concerning, particularly given that there is also a risk that consumption may be increasing again following a period of decline. We have taken sustained and effective action since 2009 through our alcohol framework, which has over 40 measures to reduce alcohol-related harm. The framework is having an impact, but we know we need to do more. We are working on the next phase and intend to introduce it next year. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, she will be aware that alcohol-related deaths in Scotland rose 5% to 1,152 last year. Does the Minister agree with Dr Peter Benny, Chair of BMA Scotland, that it is a continuing frustration that legislation to introduce minimum unit pricing of alcohol has been delayed due to legal challenge by the Scottish Whisky Association, and we once again call on them to drop this appeal and allow the introduction of this innovative and world-leading public health policy? I share the frustration of Peter Benny and countless others across the medical profession that this life-saving policy has been held up in the courts while Scotland has seen alcohol-related deaths rise. The opinion from the Advocate General last week very much left the door open for minimum unit pricing and we are confident in the arguments we can make to meet the tests that have been set out. We remain certain that minimum unit pricing is the right measure for Scotland and we are committed to its implementation. Richard Simpson. <clears throat> Whilst we are awaiting the decision of the European Court, the final decision on minimum unit pricing, uh, would the Minister agree with me that the UK Tory coalition and now UK government on its own ending the, over the last three years the duty escalator which was in place on alcohol um, and indeed reversing the duty on alcohol has contributed to the price decrease which is also contributing to the rise in deaths. So will the minister now discuss with colleagues publishing draft regulations for the introduction of the social responsibility levy to ensure that off licences and especially supermarkets do uh, suffer a price uh, penalty 
uh, and are therefore hopefully will, require, will increase the price of alcohol in line with the increase in wages which is now occurring and ensure that the local authorities have the funding to tackle alcohol problems. Minister. Um, in relation to uh, the point that Dr Rich Simpson makes about the social responsibility levy, can I refer him to the answer that, that John Swinney gave to a question of Kenny McCaskill's uh, yesterday? Uh, we are very keen to build consensus on public health policies, particularly when they are important as tackling Scotland's unhealthy relationship with alcohol, and we are always willing to look at, at ideas which may help. Question six, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support carers in, in, in the central Scotland region. Minister Murray Watt. We introduced the Carers Scotland Bill, which is currently at stage one of the parliamentary process. The bill is an important part of our programme of health and social care reform, which will extend the rights of adult carers and young carers across Scotland. Other Scottish Government initiatives, such as the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund, and the Carer Positive Employer Scheme benefit carers across Scotland. Scottish Government Carer Information Strategy funding to NHS Forth Valley and NHS Lanarkshire is over 865,000 for 2015-16. This is contributing to a wide range of support for carers in central Scotland. Margaret Mitchell. The Minister with that comprehensive answer, but is she aware that rather than the local framework for eligibility criteria proposed in the Carers Bill, carers want a national framework within Scotland to ensure equity, fairness and consistency and in order to avoid a postcode lottery. Is she sympathetic to this view? Minister. Uh, well, uh, can I say that my colleague Jamie Hepburn, Ministers for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health, met with the North Lanarkshire Carers Together and the National Carer Organisation representatives on the 27th of August to discuss, amongst other matters, the proposals for the national eligibility framework. And as a result of that, officials are currently considering the NCO proposal for a national eligibility framework. And we are li liaising with NCOs and COSLA on the framework. And we will make a decision in due course. Question seven, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on repatriating the red meat levy paid by Scottish livestock producers in England. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the issue of red meat levy repatriation has been an ongoing matter of concern to the Scottish Government for a number of years. While good progress was made at the last UK wide industry forum established to consider alternative levy allocation methodologies, this issue must now be resolved to bring an end to the disadvantage that has caused the Scottish red meat industry over the past decade, particularly to respond to the current challenges facing the sector. And we will be pressing DEFRA to accelerate the process to provide a fair and equitable settlement. Angus MacDonald. I uh, thank the Minister for, his, uh, for our reply. We have seen the good work uh, Quality Meat Scotland does promoting our world-class quality Scotch meat, with the success of the recent Love Scotch Lamb Weekend uh, being a great example. Uh, clearly, much more could be done if the levies paid in England by our producers were returned, coupled with capacity for slaughtering in Scotland being increased. Will the Minister undertake to work along with the Cabinet Secretary and the industry to increase the capacity at Scotland's abattoirs and continue to lobby the UK Government to ensure red meat levies due to us are returned from England uh, to help further promote our booming food and drink industry? Minister. I wholeheartedly agree with my colleague on the very good promotional work that is carried out by uh, Call to Meet Scotland, not least their recent lamb campaign, which I understand will target 3.7 million consumers and reach over 90% of Scottish adults. I have no doubt that were the levies that ended up south of the border repatriated, this would have had a direct and positive impact on the work that QMS would undertake. And I can assure uh, my colleague that the Cabinet Secretary and myself will not stop pressing on this issue until such time as this has a satisfactory resolution. Of course, not all of the lost levy comes from the sheep sector, with approximately 30 per cent derived from pigs. In November this year, with the assistance of our £2.7 million grant funding, the new Brecon facility opens, and this effectively doubles the slaughter capacity for pigs and ensures that Scotland has the ability for all pigs born in Scotland to be slaughtered in Scotland. A recent study by Quality Meat Scotland confirmed there wasn't a lack of slaughterhouse capacity in Scotland at the moment, excepting pigs. However, the Scottish Government is always ready to consider applications for support to invest in the meat processing sector, including abattoirs. Thank you. That ends general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions.